Добрый день. Good day. This is the program Binding, and I am Andrea Lokhin. Today's guest is a person whose face has been seen a thousand times by Ukrainians on their TV screens, a war correspondent, reporter, a woman who's visited the war zone many, many times, who has reported directly from villages and settlements on the front line. This is the now famous Natalia Nahorna, who has written a book about the war. And there is one interesting fact. The book has been long anticipated, and when it was finally released, it turned out not to be an ordinary collection of reports. Rather, it is… Well, in a word, let's talk to Natalia, and you will understand everything yourself. Natasha, although there are many war reporters, there are women among them, but not everyone writes books. And after all, regarding this book, especially this particular one, it is a real book. Normally, if a reporter releases a book, it's just a collection of news reports. It is being printed, stuck together by some binding thread, and here it is, a ready book. In your case, it is quite the opposite. Judging by the book, nobody would say that you are a famous reporter who was reporting on the war. The book is talking about you as a writer who sees the war from the inside. How did you hit on the idea of writing a book, not a broadcast news clips, but a book? In fact, the book began to appear when I was taking a break from the war. I was abroad, my phone was turned off. The phone was used as a writing pad. And so I was sat writing stories and reading them out loud to my friend who fought in the anti-terrorist operation. And at the time, I realized that could possibly spoil his vacation, because when I read them out, he was almost in tears. Although he is a strong man who went through involvement at Donetsk airport twice and at the boot of Kamai. I read short stories to him and he liked them. Then I wrote 50 stories. These stories were written through the voice of a small girl, on behalf of a girl who sees the war on TV. He is about the war by phone, because her dad is in this war. She is a girl who perceives the war through the emotions of her parents. I most likely perceive the war in such a way too, as the reporter sees the war through the camera. Why does everyone say that reporters are so bold? No, in fact, we perceive everything that happens behind the camera as something that is not quite real. That's not happening to us. There is something else there, behind the scenes, and then something happens to them. Nothing can happen to me, everything will be fine. And so we also watch the war as if it is on a TV screen. And sometimes it seems to me, and I say this all the time, that I myself was like a little girl who watched this war and quite often to a TV set. At the risk of running ahead of myself, let me say a small spoiler here, that the stories are told from the perspective of a few characters, father, mother, from a child's and even a cat's perspective. So basically, you are that small girl who tells you that her father, who is at war, and so on. Yes, but there is probably a certain part of me in each of the characters. There are also a lot of other characters whom I've met at the stations, in the ATO zone, who I met in the hospitals, on the streets, and I saw, well, it is very easy to recognize a person who feels bad after war, just walking across the street. And these are people who are the heroes of these stories. That is, they tell not only about what happened to them, they talk about what happened to all of us in the past four years. There are not some kind of super positive characters. As a reporter, I saw a lot of things that aren't usually included in television coverage. Well, simply because they are not necessary for coverage. For example, if we create a story about a certain case of looting, it would mean that the whole Ukrainian army consists of looters. It's not true, except for some cases, particular cases which can be discussed now, understanding why it was going on in the way that it was. Will you take the Washington machine out of the bomb house simply because the military wants to wear clean clothes? Well, do we value clean clothes in everyday life? Or the opportunity to wash in a shower but not using a one and a half liter bottle? Mm -hmm. I wrote about the priceless things that I saw there. Here's one of my favorite stories. This is what I saw in August 2014. That was the first time I'd seen a Grad missile launcher. This is a BM-21 that shoots long-range rockets. And that was at a time when I was doing my own coverage, as I'd gone there without a cameraman. I was filming it all, and there were T-shirts, underwear, socks that were dried on a washing line. This deadly truck looked completely different in my eyes, and all these stories there are like that. 
The story about the new year, about birthdays, about gifts, about the difference between how they watch TV there and at home. We had many fighters who refused to give interviews because they didn't want to become recognized by someone back home, so they would not know their location. Sasha, the girl from my book, eagerly awaits all television reports because what if there is a report showing her dad, even from the back, and what if he were to say hi to her? This was 2014 to 2015, when quite often there was no connection and there were no opportunity to send even a greeting. Or, for example, there is a story about soldiers watching TV and a story is shown where... Well, this is such a framework inspired by American stories. When fathers come home from war without telling their children in advance, we also took part in an experiment here. I myself helped in getting these two soldiers free. And so they came back home. We filmed this story, and we were in tears. My colleague filmed just really amazing material about this. And now I understand perfectly how they could perceive this material, because many of guys left at home a lot. It was important for all of them. And yesterday, one of the fighters called me, and he said, you know, I've read your book, and you know what? I thought I was the only person who thought in exactly this way. These stories are no super-duper original stories. There are no cases there of heroic pathos, which is usually associated with writing about war. Like, look, who raised 20 flags, captured 30 villages, and received 40 medals. I tried to do it in a different way, so that there were no such things. Or in its true colors, as it is. Well, if you have noticed this famous report, it's impossible to take your eyes off the face of the speech. It's quite noticeable that the person works on TV. And yet the most important thing is what happens next when a reporter, a young beautiful woman, appears in the war zone. И это еще к тому же молодая и красивая женщина. Что происходит дальше? Наташа, ну Наташа вот well, you wanted to become a journalist since you were a child. As far as I recall, you were on holiday in some pioneer camp. Came and said, Mom, I want to be a journalist. Your mom, who was horror-struck, said, no way. However, you became a journalist. You became a reporter. You were reporting some events, perhaps accidents, and so on. And suddenly, war broke out in the country. We were attacked. How did it happen? Did they simply say the order has been given for him to go to the West, for her to go to war? Or did you go yourself and say, I want to go to war, voluntarily? How did it all happen? How did you, a beautiful young woman, end up in the war? Young, beautiful and trained. Yet even before the events of the Revolution of Dignity, I'd been in a few unpleasant situations in which I realized the need to have medical aid skills. Like when a person is lying down and he or she needs help. I then decided to attend a few first aid Courses. And it turned out that it was during the revolution that I passed lots of such courses, right up to being included in a Red Cross emergency response unit, the aim of which was to quickly move out injured people when necessary. And when events on May Dan were turning into events in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, I then passed a medical aid course in circumstances of an armed conflict. That's tactical medicine. It could turn out to be vital for journalists, by the way. And as far as I understood, prior to the outbreak of the war, I was one of the most qualified in that regard. I mean, I'm always doing training of one kind or another. For example, like training on how to behave in captivity. So when the war began and the management had to discuss who to send, they said and just said something like, well, let it be Nahorna, right? Anyone but Nahorna. Why? Oh no, of course not, I'm just joking. But actually, according to the initial requirements, there could be only men who already had experience of being in a war zone. There were correspondents who acquired such experience earlier. There were in Georgia during the events of 2008, survived airstrikes, so we were certainly way better prepared for shelling. So how did you get there in the end? It took a lot of grit in addition to willpower, and I managed to show a certain level of insistence in my requests, so that they finally say, go wherever you want, or rather, wherever 
forever, but not on the front line. But I did it anyway. I'd been suspended from traveling for a certain period because I had been present at two prisoner swaps in a row. Well, to be honest, you're a very well-trained lady. What attracted you to the front line? What were you thinking about at that time? After all, to be honest, normal women, beautiful women, should stay at home. Well, wait on the men coming from the war. I don't know. Anyway, this is a common image, a stereotype. But all of a sudden, a young woman says to her managers, no, I'll be there, I won't film the war. How come? Well, you know, there are several explanations. Some of my friends say, this is just an adrenaline addiction. Even before the war, I was involved in parachuting, paragliding, snowboarding, and a bit of wakeboarding. I've always liked something dangerous, I guess. I know that you had a dream, even in peacetime, to file a report from a zone of hostilities, but of course, somewhere in another country. And the universe received this message and said, OK. No, wait. Wait, dear universe, that's not exactly what I had in mind. Actually, we had to write an essay on the topic of why I decided to become a journalist when I was in my first year. I wrote that I want to become a war correspondent. I even forgot about that. And then on one occasion, in 2014, my university fellow said, so are you ready to face it? There are four main characters in the book. This is the father, who was in the war, the mother, the nine-year-old girl, Sasha, and even the cat. But I'd say that the main character is the girl. Finally, the main narration is spoken on her behalf. So, Nahorn meets such girls and boys, she comes to schools with her book. And it's very interesting to know who they are, today's children, children who know very well what war is. Нынешние дети, дети, которые очень хорошо знают, что такое война. Наташа, ну вот, например, рисунки к книжке вот эти дети. Наташа, well, for example, these children's drawings, they were done by you. I know that you meet with groups of children, tell them about the war, with this book in your hands. How do modern children perceive war and books about war? Книги о войне и вообще, в принципе, войну. Well, I think it depends a great deal on the parents, I mean on the level to which the family was involved in it. Although there were a lot of cases on the front, and I mentioned them in my book, where children wrote letters to soldiers. It was such a peculiar thing. It was like a lucky charm for every soldier who had it. You can even approach almost any soldier or military volunteer asking, show me your children's letter, and possibly he will take it out, for example, from a bulletproof vest or from a helmet. They could possibly be everywhere. That is, everyone surely had a flag in a children's letter. When the fourth year of the war had already passed, the fifth year began, and children we were once invited to be a member of a commission of the National Council of Television and Radio Broadcasting. And there was an idea that the war should be shown on TV so as not to harm the minds of children. For example, for example, bomb schools couldn't be shown because a child can associate it with his school in his mind. I was probably strongly against this idea. I think we need to bring up a generation who must live in such a way that their school wouldn't be bombed. We should understand that we now have completely different children in Ukraine. On the one hand, I'm horrified when I think about, God forbid, this war dragging on for another two years. The children who have never seen Ukraine who have never known Ukraine will go to school on occupied territory. On the other hand, we have a growing generation who lost their parents because of the war, children who lost their home because of the war, children who are Sasha's friends in the book. Yes, she has a friend whose father died in action. To be honest, it's very difficult to read. Yes, but this is, for instance, a real-life character. I drew it 100% from life. For example, this girl Lenochka, a girl who lived in my house after we persuaded her parents to give her to us from Luhansk at the end of May 2014. Lenochka is a girl who painted blue and yellow flags at night with her mother in Luhansk, painted them on pillars so that any Luhansk patriot who goes outside in the morning, and this is a literal quote, so that he would know 
that he's not alone. I mean, in a big city where the war is underway, it's important for a little girl, while she was 15 to 16 years old at the time, to know that other people who love Ukraine know that they are not alone. Hopefully your book is just here. It'll do a lot if those who read it will somehow understand the idea. They will say it turns out that way. More than one. Here's precisely the same thing that I feel. Natasha, question out of blue before we finish. And will there be more books from the writer Natalia Nahorna? Yes. About what? I would want most of all to write a book how the blue and yellow flag appeared over Donetsk and Luhansk, how the war came to an end, how the war came to an end, yes. Well, I think I will publish a textbook for my colleagues, because for four years we tried it in reality, you know. For example, this is how you can do it, and this is how you should and this was done wrongly, and there was nobody to tell us. Our war is so unique that we have nobody to tell us what we should do. This experience must be passed on. Any book is a good preservation. Well, this is probably not the right word, but we have to pass on the essence of this experience. Accumulate everything. Yes, and pass it on, saying, here it is, take it. Look, here we've already made these mistakes. You will make your own mistakes, but please, at least don't repeat ours. I want to thank you, Natasha, for coming. And well, we're waiting for you and your textbook. Write faster. We're waiting for it very, very much. Thank you. I'll try my best.